بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهده واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته This is the 35th class of Islamic Fiqh and we sort of concluded talking about the rituals of Hajj and how to perform it from day one till the last day. And the last day to those who want to take advantage of the last day is the 13th of the Hijjah. You remember that a pilgrim has the option either to leave on the second day of Hajj, which is the 12th, the second day of Ayyamu Tashriq, and he can postpone and leave on the last day, which is the 13th, which is better because the Prophet had done that alayhi salatu wasalam. So the rituals of the 13th day would be to throw the stones as he did on the 12th and on the 11th after Az-Zawal, when the time of Dhuhr begins. And this is the vast majority of scholars' opinion that you cannot throw before that, yet you can throw afterwards. Unlike the new fatwas nowadays where they permit people to throw from Fajr time. And they gave this fatwa according to the crowd they see and the pressure of the people who are keen on leaving early. So some jurors looked into it and said that it's okay, it's permissible, but the vast majority of scholars in the old previous ages and till date say that this is not permissible. And the Prophet والسلام, anticipated the Adhan of Dhuhr, which means that this is the time that throwing begins. So we, we throw the first, which is the small jamara, then the medium, then we conclude with the jamaratul aqaba. Then we go straight after gathering our things to Mecca. And we can stay in Mecca as long as we wish. And what remains for us at the moment, for our Hajj to be complete and over, is what is known as the farewell tawaf. Now you remember that we said that a pilgrim has the option to delay and postpone tawaf al ifada or known as tawaf al-hajj, alongside with Sa'i al-Hajj, if he did not perform both of them on the day of Eid onwards. He can postpone those and perform them in combination with the farewell tawaf. So the small ibadah is combined in the big ibadah. For example, if someone is having a ghusl to uplift his major ritual impurity, this is a big ibadah. And after he finishes, he wants to go and pray. Do we say to him, go and perform wudu? The answer is no, because the wudu, which is a small ibadah, was embedded in the large ibadah. Likewise, if I come to the masjid and I pray 
the Fajr prayer congregation because they were already praying before me. Or I, I joined them in Dhuhr after I finish. Do I stand up to pray two rak'ah of Tahiyyat al-Masjid? The answer is no, because this small ibadah was embedded in the large ibadah. Likewise, if I delay the tawaf of Hajj to be the last thing I do before I leave Mecca, then these seven rounds are sufficient and tawaf al wada the farewell tawaf, is embedded in them. And I don't have to repeat the tawaf again. So once I do this, I can safely leave Mecca and my hajj would be complete. Now remember that tawaf al wada is not a pillar, it's mandatory. So if I leave it, I have to slaughter a sacrifice as a fidya, expiation, to be slaughtered in Mecca area and distributed among the poor around the Haram area. Okay, now we move on to on the way back. But before that, we have to mention that stoning on the 13th day must be done before sunset. And if we do not do it before sunset, then the time is considered to be over and we cannot perform it afterwards. Now, if we will, were to look at the farewell tawaf, tawaf al wada, it's an issue of dispute whether it is mandatory or a highly recommended sunnah. But the most authentic opinion, as per the hadith of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, that the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam told people not to leave Mecca before giving farewell to the Kaaba, which means the Tawaf. And this is the farewell Tawaf. Or if it's combined with Tawaf al-Hajj, then so be it. However, those residing in Mecca will not leave Mecca and hence they do not perform Tawaf al-Wada unless they leave Mecca. Also, a woman in her postnatal bleeding, she's exempted from this tawaf. Also, a woman in her menses, she as well is exempted from this tawaf. So she can leave without any problem, as per hadith of Safiya. May Allah be pleased with her, the mother of the believers, on the farewell day. The Prophet asked, let's leave. And they said, well, we have to wait because Safiya did not perform Tawaf al-Wada'. So the Prophet asked, السلام, did she perform Tawaf al-Ifada and Sa'i al-Hajj? And they said, yes. Then he said, okay, let her leave with us, which indicates that a woman in her menses is exempted from this Tawaf. Then the book tells us that on the way back, there is a dua which a Muslim should say. And this dua, the Prophet used to say it alayhi salatu wasalam, whenever he came back from Umrah or Hajj or an expedition, he used to say it. This hadith is narrated by Bukhari and Muslim. The Prophet as Ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, said that if he went to a narrow passage or an open space or a plateau or a high place, he would say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Then he would add, La ilaha illa Allahu wahdahu la sharika lah, lahul mulku wa lahul hamdu wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. Aibun, taibun, abidun, sajidun, 
لربنا حامدون صدق الله وعده ونصر عبده وهزم الأحزاب وحده and the translation is written for you to read it and contemplate upon these beautiful words that express the submission to Allah Azza wa Jal being servants of Allah al ubudiyah when you acknowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be the one who facilitates your affairs and you praise him for that subhanahu azza wa jal now we have afterwards a section with the title of the sacrifice and its rulings and the sacrifice one understands from it that this is a form of gratitude see the things we slaughter in islam are either damu shukran or damu jubran either they are sacrifice or bloodshed for the purpose of expressing our gratitude to allah or bloodshed in order to expiate a mistake or an error that was committed so in hajj we have hadi which a mutamatti' and a qarin offers to allah and this is mandatory and there is hadi which is offered by a person performing a fraud and this is recommended not mandatory we have fidya which is an expiation we do we slaughter when we do a mistake as we will come and talk about it later on inshallah and in hajj we also have udhiya and this is done by those who do not go for hajj who are residing in their homes in their home countries so we do and and, and the people call it qurbani in urdu then we have al aqiqah and this is something that we offer we slaughter al aqiqah when a person is blessed with a child two for a baby boy and one for a baby girl there is also the walima as per the hadith of abd rahman ibn auf May Allah be pleased with him. When he got married, the Prophet told him to slaughter and invite people to a walima, to a sheep, so that they can eat from its meat, and so forth. So these are sacrifices, either to express your gratitude to Allah or to expiate a sin you have done. So here we have types of sacrifice or types of sacrifice one offering a sacrifice by slaughtering a sheep for pilgrims in the tamattu or qiran methods and this is understood the timings of it is from day of eid the 10th of the hijjah up till the sunset of the 13th of the hijjah it cannot exceed that and you offer the sacrifice either by slaughtering a sheep or a goat or being a part of seven people slaughtering a cow or a camel so for me as an individual i can offer one sheep one ram or one goat being the minimum age of the sheep is six months old and the minimum age of the the um the goat is one year but if we seven of us we can all sacrifice one cow or one camel so my share is one seventh and this is permissible now 
the ayah is mentioned where Allah says what to do. That is that you have to slaughter a sheep or an offering. But what happens if a person does not have the financial means to slaughter a sheep? I'm performing tamattur or I'm performing qiran. Allah stated in verse 196 that you should fast if you are unable to slaughter financially. You should fast three days in Hajj and seven days when you go back to your home, which means that the total is 10 days. So these three days of Hajj, when should I fast them? Well, the most highly recommended is before the ninth, before Arafah. And those who are performing tamattur, that's easy for them. So if you come a month earlier and you perform your Umrah and you stay in Mecca, during this whole month, you can choose any three days to fast. But those who come in, tamat in Quran or Ifrat, usually they come a day or two before Hajj which would make it a bit difficult. They may fast one day. See, you can't do that except after you enter the state of Ihram. So they can fast one or two days. If three days possible, then great. If not, then they have the Ayyamu Tashriq, the 11th, the 12th, and the 13th. And these are considered to be part of the three days in Hajj. Bearing in mind that these days are prohibited, generally speaking, to fast. So if someone asks you, what are the days that are prohibited to fast? Or another question, what are the days that are permissible for a person who is fasting two consecutive months to miss? The first one is Eid al-Fitr, the first day of Shawwal. So he can miss and skip that day or to rephrase that, he must skip that day because fasting the day of Eid is haram. After that, there are four days that are prohibited for a Muslim to fast. And these days are the day of Eid al-Adha, the 10th of the Hijjah, the 11th and the 12th and the 13th, which are Ayyamu At-Tashriq. These are prohibited to fast. Why? Because the Prophet prohibited it, except, and this is an exception for a person who was unable to slaughter a sheep due to the lack of money, then he has to fast three days. These can also be fasted by him in order to compensate for not slaughtering a sheep. Number two, sacrifice in compensation. And this is when a person is known in Arabic as Al-Muhsar. And he's the one who was prevented by force from pursuing and continuing his Hajj. And there can be so many reasons. One, a, poor, a person in his Ihram just before performing Hajj, he falls ill and has to be admitted to hospital. He cannot continue. The doctors say it's impossible for you to go. Another person is detained by the authorities because his visa does not seem correct or might be forged. And he came thinking that he was legit. So they detain him for four or five days. By the time he's out, the Hajj is over. A third person is prevented due to a war in his country or in the hosting country, due to floods, due to any reason that is force majeure and he's unable to continue his Hajj. Such people are ordered to shave their heads and slaughter their hadi, wherever they are. And this is what the Prophet did, alayhi salatu 
on the day of Al Hudaybiyah, the Treaty of Al Hudaybiyah, when he was banned from entering Mecca while he and his companions were in the state of Ihram and were, were told, and they were told to come the next year. So the Prophet ﷺ shaved his head and slaughtered his sacrifice where he was. Number three, voluntary sacrifices, and this is for someone who is doing Umrah or someone who's doing Ifrat, then uh, there is no problem to uh, slaughter this voluntary sacrifice. And number four, pledged sacrifices. It's when someone out of his own free will pledges to give Hadi as a vow to Allah Azza wa Jal, out of gratitude, not in exchange for something. Now remember that the hadi or the blood that is shed for expressing our gratitude to Allah, the sunnah is to eat from that meat. So in the case of hadi, the sunnah is to take a part of the meat of that sacrifice and to drink some of the soup that is made after cooking it. And I would like to draw your attention to a mistake that we commonly do, especially those who slaughter more than one sacrifice or udhiya. For example, I sometimes slaughter three sacrifices on the day of Eid, which is Udhiyah. And we know that the way of distribution of the meat is highly recommended to be one-third as charity, one-third as a gift, and a last third I eat and consume. So I say to myself, as long as I have slaughtered three rams, then I'll give one ram complete as charity and one ram complete as gifts to other families and I'll keep one whole ram for myself. Sounds fine. It is not. Because the sunnah dictates that from each sacrifice, this would take place and not to be substituted from another sacrifice. Though logically the math is the same, if I take one third from this and one third from this and one third from this, this is acceptable. So it's the same thing if I take the whole thing and consider it to be a third and a third of a third, and I give it away, collected from the other two. But this is not the case. How many sacrifices did the Prophet ﷺ offer in his Hajj? Now we know that he has to sacrifice one sheep only, or to share a seventh in a camel. But this is what's mandatory. What is recommended is anything voluntary, and this is more than that. The sky is the limit. So we are told that the Prophet ﷺ sacrificed a hundred camels on his behalf and the behalf of his wives. So even if he had his nine wives alongside of him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this means that he should have slaughtered only one camel and two sevenths of a camel. But no, the Prophet ﷺ slaughtered a hundred. Sixty-three of them with his, with his own honorable hand. He, he slaughtered sixty-three camels. And by the way, slaughtering the camel is not done by cutting the neck as we do in the case of a sheep. 
the jugular veins and the throat. No, it's an area here in the chest where they are stabbed in the chest with it. This is how it is done. So the Prophet slaughtered 63. And in Arabic, it's called Nahr. And, and Nahr means the area of the neck that joins the chest. فَصَلِّ لِرَبِّكَ وَنْحَرْ And a Nahr is done to camels and a Dhabh is done to sheep. And then he gave the knife to Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, who slaughtered the remaining uh, uh, 37 camels. The time. One, sacrifice has to be between the Eid of Hajj and the sunset of the 13th, as we have mentioned that uh, before. As for the sacrifice of for having a break and ihram restrictions, this should be done as soon as possible. So what uh, uh, kind of things that requires sacrificing for uh, uh, breaking ihram restrictions? Well, someone who left a duty someone who did not perform tawaf al-wada' and he left Mecca. The moment he left Mecca, he has to slaughter a sheep. And this has to be done as soon as possible. Maybe it's not possible to do it at the borders of Mecca because he's in the highway now. But once he reaches Jeddah, then he should do it as soon as possible and, does not, and should not postpone it. Number three, sacrifice for being prevented from continuing with the pilgrimage. And this is known as Al-Ihsar, as we spoke about. And you slaughter this wherever you are blocked from continuing your Hajj, if this is possible. Then we have the compensation, and this is known as Fidya. To compensate, to do something for violating one of the restrictions during the pilgrimage or for neglecting any of the essential duties. Number one, compensation for omitting some duties, such as a person who does not stone or a person who does not enter the state of ihram, consecration from the miqat. He passes the miqat, he comes to Jeddah, stays three days and says, I want to make my ihram from Jeddah. Why didn't you perform ihram when you flew over the miqat? He said, well, I thought this, I thought that. When tough luck, you have to expiate. You have to give the fidya. And in this textbook, it says in the fourth line, a pilgrim who cannot offer or cannot afford such sacrifice must fast three days during the pilgrimage and seven days when the ha when he has returned home. This is not correct. You have to uh, uh, cross this out from your textbooks. When do we fast three days in Hajj and seven when we go back home? The answer is when we cannot afford the sacrifice of gratitude, al-hadi, if we're performing Quran or tamattu. But to cascade that to every sacrifice due to omitting a duty or performing one of the restricted acts of ihram, and if we can not give the expiation we have to do this. This is totally not true. And by the way, there is a difference between missing on a duty of Hajj and doing something that is restrict restricted in Ihram. Things that are restricted in Ihram, we will come to discuss, inshallah. There are a choice out of three. 
while if you omitted a mandatory act of of your hajj such as one not performing ihram from the miqat this is mandatory two not spending the night in muzdalifa before that leaving arafat before sunset also not spending the nights in mina the 10th 11th 12th if you're staying late and also stoning not stoning so all of these acts you have to expiate by slaughtering a sheep for each one however if you don't have the financial means to give such an expiation you don't refer to fasting or giving charity it's gone it's only limited to this there's no other alternative to it so you, I, I would expect you inshallah to scratch this out from your textbooks please is it recommended that the three days during the pilgrimage should be before the day of okay we have gone through this when one cannot find a sheep or sacrifice cannot afford it only then uh, he could fast this is with uh, regards to the hadi compensation for inability to continue with the pilgrimage journey so the, we we spoke about this and and the ihsar uh, number 3 compensation for violation of restrictions and we spoke about this again we said that anything that you do which is restricted for you while in the state of ihram you have to give expiation such as clipping your hair shaving your hair clipping your nails wearing perfume wearing shirts wearing trousers covering your head with a turban a woman wearing niqab uh, or gloves etc so all of these require expiation such as the expiation generally speaking is either you slaughter a sheep which is the most expensive of the three or you fast three days oh that's easier or you feed six poor people half a sar for each that's it and these people have to be in the area of al haram again not in your country or outside the haram borders and okay this is almost about it uh, compensation for killing the game and this is different than the other types of compensation because here we have a clear directive from Allah Azza wa Jal that whoever kills a game intentionally then he has to give what is equivalent to it and if it has nothing equivalent to it which is suggested by two reliable accepted male men then we have to give its value and if not then we have to fast according to the value so what is exactly giving something that is equivalent to it the scholars say that this is referring to the judgments and the rulings of the companions may Allah be pleased with them so the companions for example if a person hunts and kills a hyena they say you have to slaughter a sheep if you hunt a pigeon you have to slaughter a sheep and if you hunt 
other small animals like a rabbit, for example, then it has to be a four month uh, uh, goat or sheep. And if it is something b smaller than a rabbit, but it moves in a, uh, it, it's, it looks like a mouse, but it isn't. I don't know what's called in uh, English, in Arabic, they call it Yarbur or Jarbur. And once you shine the light in its face, it freezes. And people, a lot of people go to the desert and to hunt these small creatures. Uh, then there is a six month old sheep for that. And so on. If you hunt an ostrich, then you have to sacrifice a whole camel because there is the resemblance between the two. The, 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 the long neck and the big size, etc. And if it is not mentioned in the rulings of the companions, then you have to estimate the value of it and give it in charity. And if you want, you can fast a number of days equivalent to the money that was estimated, which might come up to like a month of fasting. So most likely people would not fast. They would rather to uh, give in charity the value of it instead. And that's by buying food with the estimated value and distributing half a sa'ar to a poor person. And finally, if a person has intercourse during pilgrimage, there's a compensation for that. So if it's before the first exit of Ihram, then he has to compensate that by slaughtering a whole camel. And if it was after the first exit and before the second exit, then he has to slaughter a sheep, as we have talked about that before, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. We have a number of questions. I don't know if the time would allow us, but we will give it a shot, bi'idnillah. Cassandra says, how to handle a person who hates you and is extremely jealous? I have an acquaintance who wishes me bad and is never happy with my life. I'd appreciate your suggestions. The said person eavesdrops almost whole day. I'm so tired of this. A tragedy struck our family last year and still this person wants worse for us. This Cassandra requires a, almost a lecture and it also uh, it needs a lot of give and take, but uh, this is not a counseling session. Therefore, I'm just going to give it to you as I understand it. If this person is a mahram or one of your kinship, then you are not allowed to sever their kinship. But if he is a total stranger, he does not relate to you, he's not part of your kinship, or she is not part of your kinship, then cutting them off is very easy. Ignoring them, not involving them in your life, and asking them not to come is very easy. But I most likely believe that this person is one of your kinship, whom lives with you most likely, and you're unable to uh, um, kick them out, she might be a sister-in-law who's married to your brother and she lives in the house and she, uh, you, you, you're stuck with her. If this is the case, the Prophet ﷺ dealt with so many people like this, but he always ﷺ had the upper hand in the sense that he would smile in their faces, ignore their abuse, and treat them kindly. And this was for the sake of Allah, and it was also due to the nature of the Prophet In Sahih al-Bukhari, Mother Aisha says, while the Prophet was with his companions, 
a man sought permission to enter and join. So when the Prophet heard his name, he said, the worst of people is so-and-so. Meaning that he is condemning and criticizing the person who is about to come in. Once he came in, the Prophet ﷺ made him sit next to him. He smiled in his face and spoke to him lightly. After he left, Mother Aisha objected. May Allah be pleased with her. She said, Oh, Prophet of Allah, you said so and so about this person, meaning saying that he's a, the worst of the, his tribe, etc. But when he came in, you smiled in his face and you honored him. So the Prophet said, alayhi salatu salam, in reply to Mother Aisha, O oh Aisha, the worst of people is who others avoid him, fearing his evil. Now, scholars explain this hadith, and they said that the Prophet, alayhi nature denies him from frowning in people's faces, dealing with them rudely. He would meet all with a smiling face, with hospitality and kindness. So when the man sought permission to enter, fearing that the people around the Prophet, the companions, would think that this is a man of knowledge, a man of righteousness, because the way of treatment the Prophet is giving him, salam, he warned them up front and said, He's the worst of his tribe. He's the worst of all men. So that they would not be deceived when they see the Prophet dealing with him in his natural, kind, and hospitable way. So you should do this as well for the sake of Allah. Do not defend yourself. Do not argue with them. Do not pick a fight. Rather ignore all what they do as if they do not exist, and always meet them with a smile. After a while, they will, inshallah, uh, um, feel shy and embarrassed, and they will stop their evil doing. But when you give them fuel, they will keep on burning. When you give them fuel by provo be being provoked, or objecting, or saying something that is inappropriate, they thrive on this and you will give them fuel to do more harm. Isra says, for the people granted the shade of Allah, is this a sign that they aren't going to hellfire and straight to paradise? No, this is not a sign. The only people who will not go to hell or be questioned are those who were mentioned in the hadith of the 70,000 whom will enter Jannah without accountability or torment. All others will be either shown their sins and bad deeds or, even worse, questioned and punished for them. So being in the shade of Allah, it's a good sign, but it saves you only on the day of judgment, not afterwards. So you will not suffer in the day of display when all the people are gathered in one area, one plaza, nude, uh, uh, uncircumcised, barefooted, when the sun draws closer to them. This is their gift from Allah that they are in His shade. But that does not mean they won't uh, uh, be questioned or tormented for uh, their sins afterwards. Uh, the second question for Isra, if someone makes fresh wudu nine times, um, uh, do they have to pray two rak'ah of wudu uh, once or after each and single time they make wudu? No, the answer is after each and every time they make wudu. So she, you have to make nine times prayers. Marwan says, if I give 
if I gave some uh, money to someone as a loan, the loan money will be counted in Nisab? The answer is yes. If the person you give him the loan is capable of returning it back to you, or you give a person a loan for five years. So each year you have to give zakat on that. But if you give a loan to someone and he promises to pay it back within, within a certain period of time and he fails to do that. So every time you ask him, he apologizes, I don't have, I am unable, inshallah, next month. In this case, this guy does not, uh, um, uh, if this guy does not return the money, when your zakat is due, there is no zakat on it because you are consistently uh, asking for it and he's not giving it back. Afiya says, if a person in his ihram and does sexual intercourse with the spouse, if it is done before the first tahallul, you say the person's hajj is invalid and is obliged to uh, perform a hajj of the next year. Now, is the hajj performed next year considered to be as an expiation or it can count as a lifetime hajj? No, it is your lifetime hajj. If a person is performing his hajj this year now, and he has intercourse with his spouse before the first exit from Ihram. The ruling is that his Hajj, which is for his once in a lifetime, is invalid. And he's obliged to do it the following year. The following year is his once in a lifetime Hajj, but it is part of the expiation as well. Again, Afia says, if a woman wants to fast the expiation of vow and missed Ramadan fast, can she make intention for both? The answer is no. You cannot combine obligatory acts. If I miss Dhuhr due to sleep and I miss Asr due to sleep, I cannot just pray only for rak'ahs intending both Dhuhr and Asr. Likewise, if I have an expiation to fast three days for breaking an oath, I cannot fast today for a day missed last Ramadan and at the same time for the expiation. This is not permissible. Haslin says, how to convince kids not to celebrate their birthdays when every other friend of theirs celebrate? You have to be patient. And you have to explain to them that we are Muslims. Since a very young age, you have to explain to your children that we are Muslims. We have our own identity. Why don't your friends fast Ramadan with us? Why don't their mothers wear hijab like you? Why don't their fathers grow beards and pray in the masjid? Because this is not their culture. This is not their religion. This is not their identity. As Muslims, we have our own identity and you can give them, inshallah, examples on that. Fida says, is it mandatory to keep the Kaaba on the left in Tawaf? The answer is yes, definitely. You cannot have the Kaaba except on your left in Tawaf. But if you forgot something or your child ran away and you went back to get the child and continue, there is nothing wrong in that inshallah. Haslin says, if one lies for fun and everyone knows by default it's a lie due to the fact that one uh, of the jokes, does it come under the sin? Generally speaking, lying is sinful, whether you're joking or you're serious. Some scholars say that if it is too obvious to the people that this is not true, then this is not considered to be a lie, especially when people teach others. Yeah, for example, it was uh, reported that a Shabi, may Allah have mercy on his soul, one of the great Imams of Islam, 
was once talking to his wife on the street and a man approached them seemingly that he has a fatwa he needs so he asked who is a shabi and a shabi looked at him and smiled and said she is what kind of question is this i'm a man and she's my wife she's a woman she's fully in hijab and you know that a shabi is a man how do you ask such a question so sometimes you get like weird answers according to how weird your question is so if people know that this is not a true statement and that you are not telling the truth and, and it's so obvious this would not be inshallah sent for oral lie but when it is ambiguous when it can be then it is sinful and people must avoid it. May Allah forgive us all. Sayful Islam says, is the three rak'ah, witr, prayer, mandatory? The answer is no, not even one rak'ah. It is not mandatory. The most authentic opinion is highly recommended sunnah. Afia says, if I made the intention at night to fast tomorrow, but I only woke up two to three minutes before adhan, you said it's obligatory to fast on that day. No, I did not say that. And this is the biggest problem we are facing when answering people's questions. They hear an answer or a lesson and they assume that they understood it correctly and they come fight with us. You said that day so and so. Akhi, I didn't say. Yes, you said that. I saw it in the YouTube link. Okay, can you please go and watch it again and come back to me? No, but you said this. I'm sure. I'm certain. Yeah, Akhi, go and just, yani, for the sake of argument, go and just quote it to me in seconds so that I can watch it. They come back and say, oh, sorry, Sheikh. Wallah, I misunderstood you. And the same thing with, is happening here. You said that if I wake up two to three minutes before Adhan, I must fast. I did not say that. I said that if a person intended to make up for a missed day of Ramadan and went to bed and woke up two or three minutes after the Adhan, he did not have suhoor and his niyyah cannot be changed because the adhan has been called so the day has started he or she must continue to fast but making up missed days of ramadan is optional i can do it today i can do it next week i do it next month it's up to me so if i intend to fast a missed day of Ramadan. But I woke up a minute or two before, before the Adhan. Ah, before the Adhan. Then I still have the choice to whether intend to fast or skip and make it tomorrow or the day after. In this case, you can change your mind. So I hope this answers you and be and feel more than free to go and check where I said that, listen to it, and quote me again if I was wrong. Hasleen says, the word Sa'at al-Istijaba, the hour of response, is it only for the Friday after Asr, or can be also to any hour where Allah responds to us, whether it's the last third of the night, when it rains between that and the Qama? No, it can be for all. So it is a general hour where Allah Azza wa Jal responds and it's not limited only to the last hour of a Friday. It can be any hour at the night time when we go to bed and wake up. This is also Sa'at al-Istijab. Fida says, if a man has 128 cattle, should he give four tabi'ah or three musinnah as zakat because four 
30 equals 3, 40 equals 120. What do the other uh, eight cows um, do, etc.? Well, I believe that um, uh, the issue is 120 is the beginning of the number of cows until 130. So from 120 to 129, we have a set of prescribed zakat, which is either four tabi'a or three musinna. And the choice is yours. Because in the beginning, we said that from 30 to 39, there's one tabi'a or tabi'a. From 40 to 59, there's one uh, uh, musinna. So when you come to 120, these are four tabi'as or three musinnas. The choice is yours. There's no problem in choosing either one. But what about the extra eight from 120 to 129? We said that this is a prescribed zakat. But what about the extra nine? There's no zakat in them, and this is called waqas. And an awqas, which is between the set parameters. So we have from 30 to 39. This is from 30 to 39. These nine are waqas. There's no zakat. Only in the whole amount, we have one tabi'ah. Once it reaches 40, there's one musinna. From 40 to 59, 19 cows are no zakat in them. Because they're in addition to the 40, we have one musinna and so on. And, and as I said earlier, this is a little bit confusing, except for those who rear cattle and, and this is what they do. Fatima says the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ to Abu Dhar, where he says that woe be to the one who talks and lies to make a group of people laugh. Woe to him, woe be to him. Is this any kind of lies? Are these harmful or filthy lies or all the lies regardless of their consequences? The hadith is restricted to a description, and that is he's lying to make people laugh. It doesn't describe any what type of lying it is. So it can be something that is filthy. It can be something that is imitating others. It can be any of the reasons. And the best who fall under this description are those known as stand-up com comedians because they lie to make people laugh and people don't know whether they're telling the truth or most likely they're not but still their profession is totally prohibited uh, Subin Fatima says what to do in case of harassment this is too generic you have to be more specific uh, Dhul Qarnain says the COVID-19, are the COVID-19 dead martyrs? Yes, inshallah. And is ghusl mandatory for them? The answer is yes, it is mandatory. Rashid says, lost some money. Do I have to pay zakat on that lost money? If the date for your zakat is due and you did not give your zakat yet, and then the following day you lost your money, you're obliged to give zakat. But if you lost your money before the date of maturity, then there is no zakat on that specific, specific amount. And finally, Abdul, I don't know if your name is correct, Abdul Ikram. You can't have your name as Abdul Ikram. You have to change it by deleting Abdul. Just be called Ikram. What if a woman did tawaf al on the sixth day of menstruation who normally finishes in seven days but it was 
the last before the day of Dhul Hijjah. We said that that the farewell tawaf or tawaf al wida a woman and her man, man says it, she's exempted from it. So she, what she did was totally wrong and sinful. She cannot perform tawaf while in the state of menses, menstruation, especially if it is only for that reason, which is the farewell tawaf. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Until we meet Monday, inshallah, I leave you. Fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.